When we're born, we are needy, right? I mean, <laughs> I was just with my little grandbaby, you know, who needed to be fed and needed to be changed. And that was so fun, by the way. But, but when we're born, we're completely reliant on the care of others. We have no real control of our lives. And then as we grow up and go through adolescence and even into adulthood, we, we take control of our lives. Some of that's good, I suppose. It's being responsible. We begin to make decisions, but then the older you get, which some of you are there and you'll understand what I'm about, about to say, the older you get, then you, you begin to realize that the control that you thought you had was an illusion. <laughs> that's, that's really maturity. And, and spiritually, that's maturity. When you, when you realize that even though you are you know, making decisions and doing things, you're not in control of your life. God is in control. I think that's what a spiritually mature person understands, that God is sovereign over the affairs of mankind. God is sovereign over your life. God is sovereign over my life. As we're following along with Jesus now, he's going to the cross. And we're going to be looking at that issue of control. Who's, who's in control? Let's read our text again, John 19, 16 through 30. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read the inscription, for uh, the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop, and they brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So, as I said, we're going to be looking at this passage in two parts. I wanted to, I wanted to, to do it all today, but it just was too much. There, there's just so much here. There are three things that I want to look at specifically as we look at the whole thing regarding these last moments of Christ's earthly ministry. Today, we're going to be looking at his control. Next week, we're going to be seeing his compassion and then the completion of his ministry. But this issue of control, I, I, I want to demonstrate from the text that Jesus is in control. 
He's in control, really, of every aspect of what's going on. He's in control, first of all, of his own person, his own body, his own life. But then we're also going to see that he's in control of all the circumstances. He's in control of the means of his death. He's in control of the location of his death, even the declaration that's made. And it's all evidenced by the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. I I feel like an attorney, like I'm about to make a case. Like literally, that's the way it feels. I'm about to make a case. If you're not a believer, if you're here today, or you're watching this online and you're not a believer, get ready. Because I'm going I'm to present to you the proof. And so first, the control of his person. He is in complete control of his person. And, and it certainly doesn't seem like this. Like from the language, when we, when we read just the opening lines here, so he was handed, he then handed him over. Who? Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus. You read this language and it seems like he's not in control of anything. Pilate had said earlier in verse 10 that he had authority over Jesus. Remember the discussion a couple weeks ago? He, he, says, he, he, he talked about his own authority. Jesus rightly corrected him regarding where that authority came from, but he never denied that Pilate did, in fact, have have some authority. He just corrected him as to, to who was in authority over him. God does give authority to men, but that does not mean that Pilate was in control. Like, there's a, there's a difference there. He had some authority. It came from God. God was in control. The Bible tells us that that Jesus humbled himself. This is the the language from Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In other words, he became obedient to that authority by his own choice. And that is so important, isn't it? It It wasn't forced upon him. He chose to be humble. He chose to be obedient. It was by his own choice. It says he was, he was handed over to them, the Jews. Well, the Jews couldn't execute Jesus. This had to be carried out by the Romans. But it was the will of the Jewish religious leaders, right? We, we saw that over and over. This is what they wanted. This is what they demanded. They couldn't do it. You do it. So he was handed over to them, but but in the end, the Romans had to do it. Pilate was surrendering to their will. Then then in verse 17, it says, they they took Jesus, therefore. Again, this language seems as though he, he has no control. They took him. Of course. Of course, they did. It's it's true. They took him. But this is also his purpose. Look at what he said in John 12, 27. He says, my soul has become troubled. He knew what he was about to go through. And he says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. This is is why he, he came. For this very thing, this very act that we see. In verse, again in verse 17, now it says, he went out. He was handed over, they took him, but he went out. Pilate, the religious leaders, the crowd, they all had a role, but it says he went out. And I think that's just important. He purposed to do this. We read in John 10, 17 and 18, for this reason, he said, the father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me. Who's in control there? 
He says, no one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. He said, he's just, he said listen, yes, they're doing this to me, but I'm, I'm allowing it. I'm in control. And I, I just want to hammer this point home. Jesus is in complete control. Other people are involved. But this is the sovereign plan of God, literally, from the beginning of time. This is what, this is what the Bible is. All, this is the culmination of, of the gospel story. It, when we go through personal trials, like who... Who's gone through a personal trial? Who's going through a personal trial? Like we have them all the time. Sometimes they're major, sometimes they're minor. We go through personal trials. Here's the thing we need to understand, and especially those things like medical trials, you can feel like a pinball, and you're just bouncing off of the obstacles, off of the circumstances, and you, you don't really have any control. I mean, that's the nature of the trial, isn't it? You lose control over something. And it, and, it, and it can be a drag. Now, the truth is, you may, in fact, not have a lot of control in the midst of a trial. But we know that God is in control. God is in control. And he's never out of control. He's never out of control. He's God. In our trials, our faith is tested. It's tested. It, 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 it's not challenged so much as it's proven. In the midst of the trial, you find out what's there. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it describes this. Peter writes, In this you greatly rejoice, even, th even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. There you go, various trials. That means yours whatever it might be, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That trial is given to you as a gift to prove your faith. Charles Spurgeon said, trials are no evidence of being without God since trials come from God. There are some of your graces which would never be discovered if it were not for your trials. Isn't that true? It's in the midst of the trial that you grow and you learn to, to trust and to lean into the Lord even more. Our faith holds fast to the fact that God is in control. Now we're going to continue on that theme, but we have this this lesson within a lesson, Jesus goes out, he's bearing the cross, it says. He's bearing, verse 17, he's bearing his own cross. Now we have that phrase, you've probably used it or heard it. Everyone has their own cross to bear. Meaning that our particular trials are ours alone. And they are provided for some unseen benefit. You don't always know what it is when you're going through it. It's like, ah, I'm in the midst of it. You don't, you don't always see the benefit. I don't know that I would associate this term, bearing your cross, with just any trial. I think it, it best fits the trial of persecution stemming from gospel ministry. Jesus used it this way. And the way that he talked about it, he, 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 it was the call to discipleship, right? It wasn't just, hey, you know, I, I wrecked my car. That, that's a trial. But th this is the call to discipleship, the, the cross-bearing that you and I are involved in. He said to the disciples, this is Matthew 16, 24, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He's, he's talking about, Cross-bearing in the sense of the gospel. The idea of cross-bearing is that the disciple must take up the burden of sacrifice. I, th I think this is something that's missing in gospel preaching today. 
People don't want to talk about that. Liberty is often celebrated at the expense of cross-bearing, flesh-denying sacrifice. I want to I want to give you a lengthy quote. I I, I read this and I thought, well, I, I'm not even going to try to say it that good because it's just this is William Barclay, and in this point, he, he's not reliable on everything, but this is really good. He just says it may be that he will discover that the place where he can render the greatest service to Jesus Christ is somewhere where the reward will be small and the prestige non-existent. He will certainly have to sacrifice time and leisure and pleasure in order to serve God through the service of his fellow men. To put it quite simply, the comfort of the fireside, the pleasure of a visit to a place of entertainment, may well have to be sacrificed for the duties of the eldership, the calls of the youth club, the visit to the home of some sad or lonely soul. He may well have to sacrifice certain things he could well afford to possess in order to give more away. The Christian life is the sacrificial life. Again, that, that's, not, that's not preached a whole lot these days. It's what, what, what can God do for me? How can God make my life better? Not, not how, can I, how can I lay down my life? How can I pick up my cross? To take up your cross is to lose control. But here again, As Jesus carries his cross, he's not us. He is God and he is in control. Now, there's something quite interesting about this. And you may, you you know, if you know your Bible, you know that, that John doesn't say everything. We know that Jesus initially bore his own cross, but at some point he was given assistance. From this man named Simon of Cyrene. Look at, this is Mark 15, 21. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. What an incredible part of the story. This is someone called Simon. He's he's a passerby, so he's evidently come to Jerusalem to, to worship for the Passover. I mean, this is the definition of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, Right? So he's just like, what's going on over here? Hey, you, carry the cross. Uh, okay. But a careful examination of this part of the story tells something completely different. Now, I think the most, one of the obvious takeaways from this, and I think an important lesson in regard to application, is, is that we need to help bear one another's burdens. This this is especially true of brothers. We need help bearing one another's burdens. Amen? Amen. Oftentimes we think, well, we can just do it. I can bear it myself. Do you know what that is? That's just pride. Again, the sisters are usually better at this. The brothers, we have trouble with this. I don't need directions. You know, you know what it's like. You're you're in a store. You're lost in a store. Oh, sir, can I help you? No, I got it. I have no idea. You know, he's just circle around trying to find the right aisle. Been there a few times. I don't need directions. We think we can just bear it ourselves. It's it's just human pride. Jesus allowed Simon to help him. I mean, that, he's sovereign over this whole thing. And and he allowed it. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. These are instructions for the church. And so I would just say this, and this is kind of a, a side lesson, but be a burden bearer. Help one another. Help one another. We also need to be reminded to allow that. I think this is the more difficult. It's not not just a positive, hey, you should look for somebody to help. It's that you need to receive that. And in order to receive that, you have to tell somebody, hey, I could use a hand. 
I mean, not in a, you know, don't give us a list of all the chores you have, but just, it, you know, if it's a legitimate thing, and especially if it's, if it's some heavy burden, we can't help if we don't know. So many times, and you've heard me scold you about this before, so many times I find out about sickness or some trial after the fact, and I'm just like, what? Why did you leave me out of the loop? I didn't even, I wasn't able, even able to pray for you. Jesus allowed it. Be a burden bearer, help one another, but also allow it in your own life. Look again at, at, at Mark's explanation of this whole thing. 1521, Mark 1521. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear the cross. He mentions that Simon is the father of these guys, Alexander and Rufus. Now, you understand that Mark is writing this sometime after the event. This is many, many years after. And so as he writes this, he just drops these names, Rufus and Alexander. And he does it in such a way that you need to understand people knew who he was talking about. There's no other explanation other than the names. And so it's supposed that as he's writing this all these years later, people, oh, yeah, that's who, oh, Simon's, that guy's, those guys, dad. Now, I want you to look at something in Romans chapter 16. Uh, it, it is thought that this same Rufus is mentioned here in Romans 16, 13. Greet Rufus, it says, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Now, I, I, I want to be clear. This is a little bit speculative, but there's no other mention of a guy named Rufus other than those two occasions. And it's thought by most scholars that this encounter that Simon had with Jesus. So Simon's coming to Jerusalem to worship as a Jew. And he's just a passerby. And he gets entangled, embroiled in this whole thing. It's, it's led to his own salvation as well as the salvation of his family. His sons become well known in the church that they can just be mentioned by first names. Oh, Alexander and Rufus, this son of, yeah, we know that guy. And then Paul also mentions Simon's wife evidently had a motherly role in his own life. Do you see that? Something happened to him in the midst of all this. And, and there's also an incredible demographic note here. Cyrene is locate, located in northern Africa. This guy who came from northern Africa to, to Jerusalem for the Passover to worship, this may have been a, a once-in-a-lifetime trip for him, maybe multiple times, but probably not. That's a big trip. And here he is. He's just a passerby. He gets caught up in this whole thing. He gets to bear the cross of Christ. No doubt he gets saved as a result of this. His family gets saved. His wife becomes influential in Paul's life. Like it's an incredible, incredible thing. And, and what do you think he brought home with him as he goes back to northern Africa? Hey, I went to Jerusalem. Let me tell you what happened. Are you kidding me? It's an incredible thing. There are no accidents there are no coincidences. And what we see here is that God is sovereign. And he's orchestrating all of the events. He's orchestrating all the events in your life as well. And we don't always see it. It's not always obvious to us. But we need to know he's in control. Warren Wearsby said it this way. He said, in the life of the trusting Christian, there are no accidents, only appointments. Amen to that. And I, I hope that's enough. I hope that's enough evidence for you to understand that, that Jesus here, in the context of what we're reading, he's in complete control of his person. He's in complete control of his own body and these things that were happening to him, he's in control of. Now, the next thing I want to look at is the, is the control of the means. 
the means of, of his execution. Of course, we, we understand it's the cross. It's the Roman cross. How many times did he mention this in his life? He, he talked about it over and over again before it happened. He knew how he was going to die. John 8, 28, he says, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak the things as the Father taught me. People wrongly interpret this as though what he's talking about is if we worship Him, lift Him up that, that way. No, what he's talking about is being lifted up on the cross. This isn't the only mention. He says it a few times. In reference to, the scripture makes it clear, in reference to the manner of his death. The Jews would have loved to have killed him. That's what they, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to kill him. They, they would have only stoned him. That was their means of execution. They, they wanted to stone him for what they perceived was blasphemy, but God was in control of the means. It says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. This is what he did for us. This is what he did for us on the cross. He endured our, our curse in order to take it away. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, he, he made him, God made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The cross was public, humiliating, excruciatingly violent, and yet it was God's plan. It was God's plan from the beginning. Isaiah 53.10 Isaiah writes about this. He says, the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render him himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. It's weird language to read that the Lord was pleased by what happened to Christ. It's not to be understood as God being happy, but rather that it was his good plan. That's what the language means. It was his good plan. His good will was that Jesus, the Messiah, would suffer in order to save. He's, control, he's in control of his person. He's in control of the means of his execution. Next, we, we see that he's in control of the location. It says that he was led to a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Likely it was called that because it resembled a skull or, or some speculate that it was a, just a place of execution. Thus it was called. The Latin translation of Golgotha is Calvary. King James Bible uses that in Luke's gospel. It's the name of our church because of what happened there. Now the exact location of this is a mystery today. There is a traditional location on which has been built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This was officially declared the site of both the crucifixion as well as the tomb of Christ. In 325, it was, it was proclaimed by Helena, mother of Constantine the Great. When we go to Israel, I don't go there. It's, it's a disgusting site to me. It's gaudy. It's, it's filled with religious trappings and icons. And it's, it's just not a worshipful place. It's, it's, it's been ruined. We go to an alternate location, what's known as Gordon's Calvary, which is a, it's a beautiful garden with a hill just adjacent to it that has the, the look of a skull in the face of the hill. And it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful place to go and to worship. And in the garden, there's a tomb that's a, a perfect representation. Now, I don't know. And, you know, the, of course, the tour guides, they're always saying this is the exact spot for sure. And we don't know. I, I like to make it really clear. We don't really know. But this place, the Gordon's Calvary, it fits all the criteria biblically. 
And it's a beautiful place to go and remember. The other place, uh, I don't want anything to do with it. Regardless of the location that we think of today, the actual place that's described here is incredibly significant. And again, we see that God is sovereign over it. It wasn't just any place where Jesus was killed. It was a particular place. And this goes all the way back. Genesis chapter 2, or 22, verse 2, you remember the, the story of Isaac? Isaac was the son of promise. The child that God promised to Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, and, and he is going to be the father of the nation. The nation is going to come from him, and a seed will come from him. That will bless the world. And then he said, okay, now go sacrifice him, which is the weirdest story. But then we also understand that it's an incredible picture of what we're reading about that happened on Calvary. God said, take now your son. This is Genesis 22. Two, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Just go, Abraham, take him, take the wood and go and sacrifice your son. And Abraham was obedient to that. It, he didn't end up sacrificing, obviously. At the last minute, the Lord provided a ram. He said, oh, you know, don't kill the boy. God provided the sacrifice. But this is what Abraham said in Genesis twenty two fourteen. Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. So where's this place? Well, it's the, it's the land of Moriah in which there was a hill. The land of Moriah in which there was a mount called Moriah. This is where Solomon built the temple. Centuries later, 2 Chronicles 3.1, it says, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. David, David purchased this land as a place to sacrifice to God and eventually as a place... He, he, he purchased the threshing floor, and then he said, I want the whole property. He, he purchased the land of Moriah, the same place where God had sent Abraham with his son Isaac, in which it was declared, this is the place where the Lord will provide. And, and, and Mount Moriah clearly is the area that we presently know as Jerusalem. It's the center of the universe. It's, it's the epicenter of the world, even today. This is where Christ was crucified. Now, regardless of knowing the exact location, we can be certain that God provided the sacrifice in the exact location that's described in Genesis 22. In the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. It's an incredible thing. And, and even if you don't, even if you don't believe all of that, it's still, it's still the epicenter of the world, right? It's like, just read the news. We're, they're con it's, it's a constant thing. Jesus was in complete control of all this. God is in complete control of all of this. Christ, Christ was crucified in the exact spot that was written up. Next, we see the control of the, the declaration, this, this inscription that, that Pilate wrote. It was customary for the Romans to post a sign of what the charges were for those who they executed. This Pilate did, and he did it in a way, knowing that it would infuriate the Jews. You know, he's kind of a snarky guy. He's like, yeah, I don't really like these guys. I'm having to do their bidding. I've already, I've already I've washed my hands of this whole thing. I don't want really anything to do with it. And so he, he posts this, that Jesus says that, that Jesus is the king of the Jews. And they're, they're, they're like mad about it. And not only did, it, did, it, did he take this jab at them, he made sure it was posted in all the languages. 
of all the passers-by so that everyone who, who was coming into the city, evidently this whole thing was on a path leading into the city. And they could come by and go, oh, that guy, he's, he's the king of the Jews. In Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, they could all read it. The other gospel writers mentioned that people were passing by and they could read that inscription. It was located on a road into the city. Well, Jesus is the king. He is the king. He's already affirmed that. In his exchange with Pilate, he said, it is as you say. The Bible makes it clear that he's the king. Not just of the Jews. But he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Revelation 19, 16, it says, On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Pilate thought he was being cute. What I have written, I have written. He's just a pawn. When Jesus, the returning and conquering king, comes, he'll have this inscription. Here on the cross, he's no less a king, yet he's the rejected king. He is king of the Jews, but they rejected him by their own, by their own declaration. Verse 15, we have no king but Caesar. Wow. Again, Pilate has motives of just mocking the Jews and Jesus. God's in control. God's in control of him. God's in control of what was written. He's in, the, in control of all the circumstances of Jesus' death. This means, again, his, the means of his death, the location, the declaration. And it's all evidenced by the overwhelming, detailed, fulfilled prophecy. Look again at verses 23 and 24. It says, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his outer garments and made four parts. A part for every soldier. And also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. They said to one another, let us tear it. Or let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. These are just the soldiers. They're just doing what they do. They're just being common. They divided up his clothes. They cast lots for his seamless tunic. Tunic. Clothing was made by hand in these days. It was, it was expensive, right? It's not like, hey, let's take his clothes down to goodwill. Like it's valuable stuff. But even this. As John points out, this was prophesied in advance. He, like, if you're a skeptic, you have to deal with that. You may not like it, but it was prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened. In Psalm 22, again, it's not, it's not like you could make this up after the fact. They have Psalm 22. Written by David, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of years prior to that, but, but this event is precisely written about. I, I want to read a lengthy passage from Psalm 22, verses 1 through 18, which describes all of this, but also includes this aspect of the clothing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, O oh, you who are throned above the praises of Israel. In, your in you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man a reproach of men, and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. 
Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from my birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death for dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Now, in understanding prophecy, we understand that when David wrote that, he's, he's, he's thinking of his own trial. He's thinking of his own trial, which he had many severe trials. But we also see that it's prophetic of the Messiah and it's perfectly fulfilled in what Christ was going through on the cross. Even, even to this last line that the people are, they're, they're, they're staring at him. Again, the, this public execution. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Even the detail being perfectly fulfilled, and this is what John is recording. There's something else that's that's just absolutely wonderful in this Psalm 22 passage, and I want to walk you through it real quickly. Again, we're talking about control. God is in control of this whole thing. He, he, he was in control of it when, when Isaiah said, you know, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. He was in control then. He's in control uh, of David's tongue and David's pen as he's writing this of his own trial. In verse 6 of Psalm 22, David declares, I'm a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. Now, he chose a particular word for worm. There there were different words that could be used there. But he used the worm. um, Hopefully, the the word for worm is tulea. And this word appears in the Bible 40 times. 32 of those times, it's translated as scarlet. Scarlet. What David had in mind here and what the Holy Spirit inspired him to write was not a reference to an earthworm, but a particular little grub that's called the crimson worm. And and this is incredible. I want to just describe to you the life cycle of the crimson worm that, that existed in Israel and it exists to this day. When the mother of the crimson worm is ready to lay her eggs, she finds her way towards a specific type of oak tree. She then makes the difficult ascent up the side of that tree, knowing that she will never come back down again. She's come there to give life to her children and also to give up her own. Once she reaches her spot, she secures herself against the, wor- the, the wood and in a way that you, you can't pry her off without killing her. Like they attach to the wood. Her, her shell begins to turn into a hard crimson shelter. It's under the covering of this shelter where her eggs hatch. For three days... She provides protection for her children. She also provides life as the babies feed on her body that eventually dies. Once the mother dies, she produces a crimson dye that stains the tree and the children underneath her. The babies in turn become crimson worms for the rest of their lives. 
the Israelites would scrape these off and harvest them to make red dye. They learned to do this. That red dye was used in the clothing of the priests and the fabrics of the temple. It's incredible. This is the word that David used. It was this, the word for the crimson worm. What's even more, after, after three more days, something fascinating happens to the mother of the crimson worm. Her tail pulls up into her head, forming a body shaped like a heart. And then the crimson stain, it remains on the tree, but the mother worm is no longer crimson. She becomes snowy white, this waxy substance that then disintegrates and falls, flaking to the ground like snow. Do you see it? It's, it's incredible. What's contained in just this, just this one, I'm like a worm. But not just any worm, the crimson worm. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, this may have come to mind just as I'm describing this, where, where God says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they'll be like wool. That word, that word is the word. Red like crimson. Red, that's the word, same word used for the worm. This is what God's done. John, he's, he's seeing prophecy fulfilled. Jesus is fulfilling Psalm 22. He's fulfilling Psalm 53, or Isaiah 53 and more. He's describing what he sees. And he says the soldiers did these things. Again, it's like Jesus is going through all this and it seems as though all these people are doing things to him. And, and to a degree they are. The soldiers did all these things. And yet God, God is in control of all of it. The fulfillment of prophecy is the, is the greatest sign of Jesus' identity. But also of his control over every aspect of these events. His birth, his life, his ministry, his death, all written about in great detail centuries before. Here's the important takeaway. I know the crimson worm will be something that will just stick in your mind. It's, it's stuck in my mind ever since I, I read about that. It's an incredible thing. But the important takeaway for us the important takeaway for our life, for my life, for your life, is just this. God's in control. God is in control. It may not always seem like it, right? It, it might seem in your life, you might be going through a season where it seems like the wheels are falling off. And you need to know. God's in control. He's got a plan. He's working out a plan. He's got you. And nothing, nothing, nothing can thwart his plan. Not even death. Because, because it's through Christ's death that life has come for us. Father, thank you for your word. And I thank you for all the pictures contained in this. It's a horrific story, and yet it's a glorious story. As we see our Savior go to the cross, it's at once terrible and also incredibly beautiful. As you went to lay down your life for us, to pay the, the penalty for sin, the, the, the penalty that was due us, you gave up your life in order to stain us with your blood that we might be forever marked as yours and declared righteous because of your sacrifice. Jesus, thank you. What more can we say but thank you? Thank you for what you did. 
I pray that you just remind us every day, no matter what we're going through, that you've got a purpose and you've got a plan and you're working it out. And you're working it out for our good and for our benefit. Even the trials, even the difficulty, even when we feel like a pinball. Help us to trust you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.